Okay. All right. So um, what we're going to do, and I don't know if you're planning on attending all of these, um, what we're going to do is try and break it down into some step by step um, and what are uh, in in the process for starting to select a site all the way through um, to setting up the the SOPs that you're going to be having for providing the care. So in this first section, um, one of the um, big things and it was in partnership with um, Deborah with Colorado Pet Aid, um, the organizations you can see on your website. What the intention is with this was to provide specifically for organizations within Colorado who are going to be working together. Um, and so all of this has been sponsored through um, these groups to help uh, support the the work that's being done in Colorado. Deborah's not able to be with us today. She'll be with some of the future um, sessions and if you have any inf uh, questions at the end then there, her contact information will also be there. So um, my contact information here if you have any questions or want to reach me I started out originally with American Humane Association doing the disaster sheltering work for them and with that what I have um, in in breaking down this operation is looking at some initial things that we're going to do in assessing the operation so um, part of what you want to think about is what first of all what are the threats going to be to your community and so you want to look at what those threats would be because the impact is obviously going to be different depending on what it is. We're going to talk about what types of sheltering you may be looking at. We're going to be talking about the types of animals that you're going to need to facilitate. And then um, look, considering all of those things, what are the facilities? <coughs> Excuse me. What are the facilities? that might accommodate those animals in those conditions for those types of shelters. And then the big piece of that then obviously is going to be availability. Disaster season um, tends to coincide quite nicely to fair season and different things that are going to be happening, events that are going to be happening in the summer months. For shelters and rescues, it's a time where we have a lot going on with the breeding seasons. So we have a lot of animals. So what's the availability going to be? And then looking at the operation where the facility is located what's the accessibility going to be depending on the event if it's a flood are you able to access those facilities even when it's a flooding event so these are some of the questions you want to start asking yourself when you're starting to evaluate what you're going to be doing in setting up and running your operation and we'll get into more details about all of that the other piece is then looking at the site on what are the amenities at the facility, what's available, what are you going to have to do to accommodate the facility. We want to look at what the flooring is. Is it a dirt floor? Is it a concrete floor? When are those flooring types going to be feasible? When are you going to have to make accommodations for those? Um, and then overall breaking down and what the layout is going to look like to create a safe environment. And we'll get into a lot more detail about the layout of the facility once we get into the next section which is going to be next week's talk and actually looking at how we're going to arrange everything in the facility um, for the best accommodations but as you're starting to look at these facilities you want to be able to start to look at think about these pieces of it in how you're going to break it down and lay it out to accommodate those needs so um, first thing natural disasters Obviously, um, Colorado is going to have a lot of these. Um, thankfully, you guys don't have all of them. Um, oh, well, this list, yeah, you pretty much do. I guess hurricanes is the one that you guys don't have. But fly fires, floods, tornadoes, um, there's some earthquake areas in Colorado. Like, thankfully, we don't have the, the big um, concerns that they do in California. There are some concerns as far as the potential for earthquakes. 
um, and then the winner events which those winner events are obviously going to have completely different focus than what we would have if we're um, talking about more of the summer events with the um, spring floods, the summer fires, um, tornadoes. So in considering what you're going to have for your operation, looking at can you accommodate in whatever site, can you accommodate the needs that are going to result from any of these particular. So looking at animals that are coming in from a flood event, being able to decontaminate them, being able to treat them for the injuries and illnesses that are going to be uh, impacted, um, that they're going to be affected with because of the flooding. And then additionally with the fires, what kind of damage is, is um, injuries are going to happen to the animals. The other considerations obviously is going to be looking at a fire event and potential threat as the fire moves. with um, this is one that I don't know that we always think about when we're starting to talk uh, about disaster events looking at the human made as far as um, terrorist attack chemical spills the railroad tracks that run through Colorado um, the highways the amount of of um, chemicals that are being transported up and down the highways all of the considerations that you're going to have for these areas and then the impact zones for them that's going to vary in that if it's a chemical spill in a particular um, neighborhood that's impacted with that additional considerations for some of these is going to be that it's going to be a lockdown and so these animals aren't going to initially be evacuated out of the area um, people are going to be having to shelter in place so we'll talk a little bit about the shelter in place component of it and what we're gonna um, considerations that you're gonna have for those as well getting into more of terrorists and there are particular areas in Colorado where this is um, could be primary concerns obviously with the Academy the military bases looking at those as potential threat sites for terrorism and then the impact zone is going to vary on where that's being shut down the ability to transport out animals out of that so looking at housing we're probably looking at sites far more distant that you're going to be able to transport animals to so with some of this stuff thinking about not only where you're going to be sheltering animals in your community if you're a Colorado Springs community but partnerships that where you're going to be sending your animals to another community who's going to be able to support you and help set up shelters so some of the things we'll talk about we're going to be looking at MOUs uh, memorandums of understanding and mutual aid agreements in order to um, work with the animals in transporting them assistance coming in to help you remove those kind of animals from your locations um, and get them cared for in your off sites <coughs> and I apologize I'm still getting over the cold from last week that canceled this um, so I'm gonna be drinking a lot so I apologize for the coughing and the pausing so some considerations you if you're thinking about what disasters are going to impact your area you have a plan for what those disasters potentially are going to be and what you're going to accommodate your animals for the next thing you need to consider then are what types of shelters are you going to be running and so with that looking at one of the primary focuses I, is um, that we're doing co-located sheltering and with that we're talking about pet friendly shelters and cohabitation with the pet friendly shelters this is um, a lot more of what you're hearing in the public it's become a co-located shelter it's oftentimes um, accompanied with the Red Cross or whoever is doing your human sheltering with the pet friendly shelters the owners are being housed by the human shelter and then the animals are in the immediate proximity of those owners so with this that the owners are involved in the care or 
oftentimes are the primary caretakers for those animals. Cohabitation um, is less common and is much more challenging. And we'll talk about the different challenges for all of these. But with this, you have owners and animals sharing the same space, which is obviously going to cause some some problems in as far as how you're controlling that environment, making sure the proper care is there. This is <coughs> ideally not a situation where you have folks in a large shelter all living with the, them in a cot and the animals next to them. It's going to be separate locations and I'll get into more detail with that. The um, temporary evacuation shelter this is a shelter where you have both strays and owned animals. How you set up the temporary evac is going to vary because if you do have owners that are there, they may be providing care, but primarily this is going to be your stray population um, and owners will have less involvement in that. In this type of shelter, the animal, the owners are housed, are they may be staying with relatives, friends, they may be in hotels, um, they may be in a human shelter but it's not located close to the co-located shelter or to the animal shelter. So with this operation um, a lot's going to depend on being able to provide care for those animals and still overseeing the intake of the stray animals and the intake and care of the owned animals and some housing setups that will have to vary with these. The big thing to consider in if you are planning on running pet friendly shelters, your co-located shelters, is what happens to the stray animals if you're not having a stray shelter. Um, the other question is can you accommodate multiple shelters? So can you run multiple pet friendly shelters? Can you run a stray facility? And <coughs> Um, so can you have the people to meet all of the needs of all of these operations? <coughs> With a co-located shelter, the big thing in doing these kind of operations is that you have the support of the human-animal bond because you have owners and involved in the care. They're the primary caretakers of the animals. And so the problems that we run into when we're taking care of them, for those of you who are used to working in shelter operations, you're used to having the effects of animals in that environment. They're highly stressful environments. So even in a co-located shelter, it's still a high stress environment. But the benefit of being in the co-located, the pet friendly shelters is that the owners are there they're seeing the animals at least twice a day, if not more, creating a far less stressful environment for the animals, especially if the people get into a routine of caring for them so the animals know when to expect that their people are going to come. So for the animals, a happy animal is a healthier animal and ultimately for the families it creates a healthier environment for them. It gives them something to do in the stressful um, lack of control that they have in a disaster situation where they have some responsibility to continue to provide for their pet. So and ultimately hopefully it's less work that we have to do in providing care for these animals. One of the challenges with it depending on the size of the pet friendly shelter if you're doing a large-scale sheltering operation there are going to be a lot of people and it's hard to control that. If the shelter, human shelter is taking both people with animals and people who, you know, just housing the general population, then you also have that mix of folks who are going to want to come see the animals. They're not accustomed to um, being in that kind of environment, but they have nothing else to do, so they just want to wander over and look at the animals. You have to be able to set up your shelter that you're able to control that environment that you don't have the people who aren't supposed to be there there and you also have to make sure that the people who are coming into the environment um, the owners are taking the proper care of those animals um, 
And so that that is one of the biggest challenges in the control of it. Additionally, looking at what you're going to do in a co-located shelter is, I mean, the core of anything we do when we're doing this disaster work is our volunteers, the folks who are going to be providing that care in a co-located shelter who you have coming in to take care of the animals. They're assisting the owners with that, but we in theory will need less volunteers if the owners are providing care. In a smaller scale where you you have the smaller multiple co-located shelters, you have less um, you'll have less of the the large numbers. You'll have just a few animals here and there. But what you're going to have to do then is spread out the people who are going to provide the care for them and assisting them. If you're doing a really large scale co-located shelter, so you have several hundred people, you know, several hundred animals, whatever that looks like, in that case, do you need fewer volunteers? In theory, yes, because the, the owners are taking care. But reality is, is the owners aren't going to necessarily know how to provide that care. So in the beginning, you're going to have a lot more volunteers that are going to need to help take care of these animals and get the, the owners trained with what they're doing. Owners aren't used to providing. They're going to be in the wire cages. A lot of these animals may not be used to being locked. Um, people physically may not be able to provide the care for the for their animals in that environment. They can open the door and the animal goes outside and goes potty and then they let their animal back into their house. But in a disaster shelter where they're having to get down on their hands and knees, they're having to clean out the wire cages, um, they're needing to walk their animals on the leashes and keep them away from other animals. Those things are going to be really challenging for some people to be able to do. So if the goal of the co-located shelter is saying that ant owners must take care of their animals, then you're going to need to also have planned in for those who physically aren't able to um, and for those who just plain and simply aren't going to. Um, there are times I did a major co-located operation and we would have people walk in first thing in the morning and they would mark off that they took care of their animal twice a day and would leave by you know nine o'clock in the morning and but had marked off that they were doing had already done both morning and evening care so for more than 24 hours at least 24 hours these animals were going to be in the crate without any additional care and so it's making sure um, that p they aren't doing that and supporting them in what care they need if they can't provide that care or won't provide that care then what steps are you going to go to to make sure that they, the animal is being provided for. The other concerns are just for the owners to understand the realities of a disaster shelter. They, they're they going to be stressed out, the animals are going to be stressed out, and so it's making sure people realize what the rules are and why they're in place the way they are. It's not a dog park. We don't want them coming nose to nose. We don't want them playing together and explaining the health reasons we the disease spread, the potential for an animal to bite. And everybody's like, oh, my dog would never bite. My dog is really friendly with other animals. That's great, but other animals aren't. And maybe they may be afraid or they're not used to other animals. Um, it It's educating people of these things that are just make sense to us but they're not it's not going to make sense to them because they're not used to that environment so we need to make sure that they understand that not all of the animals coming in are going to um, be vaccinated and so that's the other piece is getting people to understand that we want to keep them separated so we're not spreading the diseases and even if your animal is vaccinated we still need to keep them separated so they're not spreading anything Additionally, um, looking at how people are getting the animals out of the pens um, for potential escapes. Do they know how to remove a dog from a crate? Um, with cats, do they understand for the cats? Um, we all have a cat that's at the front of the cage and it's all friendly and it wants to be touched, but as soon as you pull it out of the cage, it's freaking out and it's getting, you know, it's running. 
it's helping people understand the environment that the animal's in is highly stressful environment and so the animals are going to behave differently. So these are all some of the challenges of the co-located um, shelter. Other things to consider um, in it and because these are local events what you have are people who for a fire say where their home has been impacted by the fire but it's business as usual as far as where the kids are going to school or um, for folks who have to go to work and so looking at what additional support these caretakers are going to need in being able to maintain their lives um, and the overall things that they're going to have to do for the disaster. <coughs> so for example, um, they've got they've got to go meet with FEMA or insurance about what's going on with their properties or they need to go to briefings so they won't be able to come and provide care for it. Um, the animals, can you make accommodations in the routine so that you're able to provide the caretakers for these animals when these folks need to go take care of those things. And the other is minor children. Always, they're always a big challenge in in any shelter. I mean, most of the time our first instinct when it comes to talking about children is absolutely we do not want children to be in the animal shelter. And as much as I can understand that from an animal shelter environment, um, the other piece to consider is that the kids are highly traumatized from what's going on in the event. This may be their pet and the only interaction they have with their pet is that say for a cat the dog can be walked out to the exercise area but what about the cat or the rabbit or the other small animal that's their pet? If they're not able to go see that that pet the impact it's going to have on them. But how do you allow children to see the animals and yet be safe. So we don't want them running loose in the shelter. We don't want them sticking their hands in all of the cages. The other piece of it is if owners are required to provide care for their animals but they've got minor children and they don't have anybody to watch the children then how do they provide care for the animals if they can't bring their children into the facility? It's it's what choice do they make here and so we need to consider how we're going to help accommodate those the single parent with three little kids how do we help that parent be able to provide for the care of the animals and still maintain um, responsibility for their children and um, if the plan is and there are some groups who actually their disaster volunteer group what they do is actually provide care for children and so they set up in the Red Cross shelters or the human shelters they set up a child care place and they're all bonded and they've been background checked there's all the things that they need to do to be able to provide for those there's never an adult alone with children um, that may be a resource that you want to reach out to to find out if there can be support if you're going to have a lot of those kind of kids or find accommodations because the children can't be left unattended in the human shelter and we certainly can't have them unattended in the animal shelter. So, um, with the temporary evacuation shelter controlling this environment is much much easier because we have only the first of all the caretakers are going to be the shelter workers your volunteer groups those are the people who are going to be in that hopefully they're wearing shirts or they've got name tags they've got uniforms they've got something that designates them that they should be in that shelter so in this environment only those people who are going to be in there or if you have owners are they banded with an ID band or some other identification to be allowed into the facility but what we don't have is the potential for more people coming and going because it's not directly attached to the human shelter so the authorized people that are there we know where they are they know what they're supposed to be doing and anybody then who 
isn't designated is much easier to spot and get funneled to where they need to be. The additional benefit is you have folks who are trained. They understand animals in an animal shelter environment. They understand how the disaster shelter is working. They understand the behavioral pieces of animals in that kind of environment. What you have in that trained staff then are are going to be are going to be easier in some terms as far as getting the animals into the routines in a co-located shelter you have owners who are coming and going at all times and so you can't get those animals set as much as saying okay in this temporary environment we we'll fe start the feeding routine at you know eight o'clock and we start cleaning right after that and then the afternoon feeding is at four o'clock those routines the animals will get used to and will adjust better to the environment the other piece then is going to be the amount of risk as far as spread of disease again you have people who are trained they um, understand to wear the gloves they understand not to fix, stick their fingers in other animals cages and so they're able to control that they're also hopefully noticing if there is an animal that doesn't look like it's doing well then it's it, that animal is being looked at by a veterinarian it's being pulled to an isolation location um, that can be harder for people who for just the general public they may not notice that kind of stuff but where the trained people are noticing that escapes will be a lot less in this environment or should be a lot less in this environment because of the trained people who know how to handle animals know how to get them out of the cages can keep them separated um, and in this environment since there's much more control there's uh, less risk of an animal being removed from the cage that it shouldn't be theft um, theft in any environment people will come looking for because they want a pet or they want to just save this animal um, they have bad intentions we have people who have come through looking for bait dogs or for fighting dogs um, they want to breed there's a long list of things that people will come looking for and when you are in temporary environment hopefully you're catching all of that at the door hopefully in both environments you're catching that stuff but when you're in a busy co-located shelter it can certainly be a lot harder with um, the owners not being part of the care of the animals there's a lot of problems as far as the separation both for the animals and the owners in this if we don't have the owners it seems easier I think for them to abandon the animals so that out of sight out of mind they're overwhelmed with everything that's going on with the disaster they may not be coming back to get these guys where if they're involved in the care then hopefully they're actually coming back and they're they're you know I mean they're going to be more responsible for the animals all along so hopefully they're going to be responsible um, to take them where in the temporary environment they may be dropping them off at the beginning of the event and a week later they've never been by to see the animal in the first place and so in that it's it's likely that they may not come back at all maintaining that connection with owners is going to be huge um, and if and then you also are going to have the stray animals in this environment and so it's helping to get those animals found by their owners and then they start in the care of them because these guys may be staying at this temporary shelter so you have an animal that's brought in by animal control it's dropped off at this temporary shelter you're providing care for it an owner comes in they find that animal then moving it from the stray location within the temporary shelter do you have an owned location within that shelter that now that animal can move over to and the people can come and start spending time with that pet um, or is are they taking that pet and moving it to a co-located shelter or are they taking it and moving it you know in with them wherever they happen to be staying but if that isn't happening maintaining those relationships can be a challenge it's a much more stressful environment for the animals 
if they don't have their people, you have strangers taking care of them. Um, strangers in uniforms a lot of times taking care of them, which animals are not generally fond of uniforms. And then you have a lot of people coming through looking for their pets. So there's that constant traffic coming in looking for that pet and as it's being passed up. Highly stressful. With this environment, um, maintaining your volunteers, being able to keep it running, because one of the things with temporary, what exactly does temporary mean? So you could be running a shelter for a week, you could be running it for months. Um, the last event, Hurricane Sandy, that hit um, New York, I know that some of those shelters were open for nine months to a year, they were still housing some of those pets. That's a really long time to be able to provide care for animals in a disaster environment. Um, plus you're trying to get your operations back to normal, people are trying to get their lives back to normal, so how long can you effectively run that operation? And in the beginning it's easy to get volu a lot of times it's easy to get volunteers they're really excited they want to come in and help they want to make a difference and but as it goes on the press gets bored with it they stop covering it volunteers get bored with it they stop wanting to come and help and so um, keeping that staffed is a really big challenge and if you're trying to run your own operation, your own humane society, your own business, how do you continue to maintain that and be able to run a disaster shelter? It's very challenging. The other thing with this environment is looking at how you're going to be tracking the animals and we will talk paperwork and tracking. Um, it's critical in documenting every animal that comes in, where it came in, how it came in, um, if it's an owner has dropped it off for care, making sure that that animal doesn't lose that designation with that owner and then any animal that's coming in as stray that we're able to get them processed so we can do a reuniting with owners um, and then making sure that when the event closes down what animals have been reclaimed where that the owners are notified of that and then what animals that still haven't been reclaimed what's the process going to be for allowing people additional time to try and find those animals or are those animals then being um, put up for adoption we always want to make sure that we're never adopting out animals and that we've given people um, the most amount of time that we possibly can to find their pets. This can be really hard too. Let me go back for a second on that. Um, it can be really hard, um, especially there are a lot of well-intending groups that are taking animals in. They may not know what animals who's actually the responsible authority for the animals and so they're trying to set up their own sheltering operations and that is spreading out the animals making it harder for owners to find those so some of the things in in the planning processes is think about who's going to be involved in providing the care for the animals, setting up the shelters, where are those animals are going, and then making sure that's being publicized. Far more with the temporary shelter than with the co-located shelters, because in theory that should only be owned animals at the co-located shelters, where in the temporary shelter you're going to have both. And so knowing where those animals are going to be and how they get um, how they get reunited, how they get claimed, um, those things are going to be really important in this environment and in that standardized shelter location. Another thing to think about is going to be daycare and I know um, Boulder had done this uh, for one of the fires where they had people who were able 
to have the animals with them, but there were things that they needed to do during the day. They weren't able to have their animals in a hotel when they were out hot weather. You can't have them in the car. Um, so is it possible to set up a daycare situation for these animals where the owners are bringing them in. We actually did this in um, Colorado Springs with a few families too where they would bring them for a few hours for temporary care and then they would come back and pick them up. It allows um, it allows for the owners to do the daily business. It's less stressful for them. And reality is if you can get the animals into that routine of running of this daycare operation, it gives a chance to get them their exercise and get them out of that closed environment which helps relieve the stress on the owners so you know you have a couple crazy labs that are used to being able to run around and play now they're in a small hotel or in a car um, do we have space for them to be exercised to be walked to chase a ball um, documenting is going to be different for this so if you're planning or think that you might be able to do this kind of situation then you need to think about the additional paperwork that you're going to have and how do you process them in and out of that daycare situation so another consideration then is um, what animals do you intend to house at your shelter and if you're looking at housing from the standpoint of companion animals based on the FEMA definition and you're going to need to think about what the other animals are going to be are you where are they going to go if you're only doing the FEMA definition and we'll talk about the FEMA definition here um, are you going to be housing any exotic animals are there particular um, species that you can accommodate better than others and if not are there folks who can like are there reptile experts or that will be able to house some of these animals that I mean a disaster shelter is a stressful difficult environment anyway um, but you may not have the resources to be able to provide for reptiles that need a proper temperature or to proper climate and so how do you accommodate those and then the wildlife. You're going to have a lot of folks who will be picking up animals and bringing wildlife in. And so looking at that wildlife, we don't want it in the companion animal shelter. And you certainly want to make sure your people understand not to touch the wildlife when it comes in, that if it's in the container that it, they bring it into, it goes into a carrier, whatever your procedures are for handling that, and then who to contact if if wildlife does come into the facility, um, who to contact so that there's a place for those animals to go. The other then is your large animals and your farm animals, which none of your exotics, your wildlife, your farm animals, they don't meet the definition of FEMA. Um, and so they're not reimbursable animals as far as the expenses of the disaster. So are you housing those animals how are you housing them where are you housing them and then looking at the financial impact of the disaster if you are tr trying to provide for those kind of animals where you do that so here's the definition of of what FEMA considers to be a companion animal so it's you know the expected the dogs and cats it's got your birds it's got your rabbits your rodents and turtles but it doesn't have any of your reptiles, any of your lizards, any of these other that people are going to bring in. It doesn't mean that you can't house those animals. It just simply means that you need to decide if you're going to house them, then you understand that that's not reimbursable by FEMA. If you're housing these under a government entity, the, and, and I've seen this in some places where they it's um, a government that's responsible for, like the city is the jurisdictional authority, they're saying we're only going by the FEMA definition. So you can see by this definition that leaves a lot of other animals that people consider companion animals. Um, and and that includes looking at your goats and your llamas, your alpacas. Those are all large animals, horses, they're all our large animals. 
but reality is is i mean i've got two horses and they're companion animals <laughs> they're my friends they're you know they're pets just like my other pets and um i'm going to want to evacuate with them but then how, who pays how does that get reimbursed with um with your now this is a FEMA definition and so with reimbursement the reimbursement comes into play um, if it's declared a federal disaster so if it if it's only a state or if it's only a county or city the impact is going to be it's not going to get to this level you still need to make sure who jurisdictional authority if it's your city if it's your county if it's the state what they're willing to reimburse and what you're allowed to house um, and I know most of the areas that have already been impacted by Colorado you are setting up fairgrounds for the large animals and and the care is being provided for these additional animals it's just something you need to be aware of in your plan so if um, if you decide that you're not taking a particular animal and for some reasons it may be in the best interest of the animal like a reptile that has to have a specific habitat you can't accommodate that habitat then what you want to look for is who in your area has the expertise to do that who can you get an agreement prior to disaster that would be able to take these animals in and house them and then how do you track that and maybe it's a veterinarian maybe it's um, a shop that that you know specializes in your reptiles if you're going to be partnering with them you need to make sure that they've been pre-screened that their um, quality operations they're going to provide proper care for them and then that arrangement is between the owners and those organizations who are going to be doing that or is it it's your relationship so the people are bringing them to your shelter and then you're getting this this other group to take care of them so are those animals still your responsibility <coughs> excuse me if you aren't taking animals just turning them away is going to be a problem because people will just dump their animals and particularly animals that could become an invasive species in the area you want to make sure that precautions are being taken so that they're not dumping animals that could later result in um, huge impact on the community down the road other things to think about then is the exotics and some of these considerations is when you're starting to plan for disaster what other groups are in your area that you need to think about and that's who's selling the reptiles the exotics um, if we're looking at um, zoos your specialty sanctuaries rescues also even looking at your your backyard breeders and those kind of folks who in the community um, are going to also be impacted disaster are they prepared with their animals um, for a lot of the exotics and zoos the plan is to shelter in place and so if that's their plan do they have the resources are you going to be supporting them with the resources um, or are they able to support you can they take some of these specialty animals that would be coming that would need housing can they take any of those for the disaster and set up a disaster shelter um, for those specific kind of animals in Colorado wildlife authority you're going to be looking at um, parks and wildlife and Department of Natural Resources those if um, with those with that group contact information and what they're going to do with the animals how do they want you to handle the animals that are coming in um, and what are their protocols going to be do you want the people just taking them directly to a location or can somebody from um, parks come and collect those animals for you at the shelter rabies 
is a big issue. We want to treat any wildlife as if it could be rabid. And so the folks who are at your intake when, you know, somebody drives up and they caught a squirrel or they caught a raccoon or they caught a bat or whatever it happens to be that they're bringing in, um, they should never handle those animals. The animals should never come in the shelter. If you can find a shady spot, sit them outside. Um, get wildlife there right away <clears throat> to pick up those animals. We'll also find a lot of... Um, like deer and fire you'll have a lot of baby animals that have been abandoned so we find a lot of fawns um, those animals that are going to be brought in probably are going to have some type of injury and so who are the um, rehabbers that these animals are able to go to um, and you can get with the parks folks to find out some of that information and potentially set up some agreements with those rehabbers ahead of time and then all of the phone numbers that you need to have so that you can contact them that that's an at hand um, at the shelter so when something comes in a phone call immediately goes out to those groups and if you guys, I know I have a, there's a chat box, so if anybody has any questions, um, if you type it into the chat box, I'm happy to, you know, address those questions as they come in. We're going to do um, a large animal section, and um, so we'll talk about standard operating procedures. Um, but we're going to do with the large animal um, section looking at what animals are in your area and housing for these animals um, specific setup for these and then you know some of the recognition between the different species like making sure that your fowl your chickens and your ducks and your those animals aren't coming into contact with your exotic animals um, but housing, how you house these animals, and do you have the folks who understand the needs um, and the differences between these, for example, horses are not donkeys, are not mules, so what's the behavior of these kind of animals, how are they going to respond, llamas, alpacas, um, how do these animals respond in um, natural behavior, and then potential concerns for them in um, in the disaster shelter. For example, if you have um, the llama that's the guard animal for the sheep, how are you housing that family unit within the disaster shelter? Um, there's a question here about do we ever pass on the cost of care to the owners? Um, and no, no, I've never been a part of an operation where there's any expenses on the owner's part. These are all services that are provided. Um, and I'm not actually sure how you would be able to require or be able to get any reimbursement for those expenses. Um, the difference being if there's a medical expense and the animal has to be sent to a veterinarian, then prior to it going to the veterinarian, they can they can either take it directly to their veterinarian um, or you or I have seen, you know, where that expense is, is they sign off on it that they are responsible for the medical care of the animals. But as far as the daily care, um, that's always provided from the group that's doing the housing. And then hopefully reimbursement. <coughs> Something to think about though with reimbursement, um, it's, not, it's not a sure thing and it's not um, 100%. And it can be years before you get reimbursed from the federal government if you do everything as far as the request. And there's very specific ways of getting that reimbursement. So you want to make sure that you're part of the disaster itself. So you're working with emergency management. You're working within that system. And um, you're finding out from them, one, how they want things um, purchased. It may be that your supplies, your everything is going to the logistics person with emergency management and then they're pulling those supplies so it's not directly coming out of a budget or 
you know, veterinarians do this all the time. Um, I've seen where they're they're bringing their supplies and their resources, and they're helping the animals, which is noble. But then, when the event is over, can you continue to run your operation? And so, you want to make sure that you're in part of that system that the supplies that you're needing are hopefully being purchased through. Um, the emergency management system and not much is coming directly out of your pocket and if it does that those expenses can be added on to the reimbursement at the end um, but like I said be prepared it could take quite a while for you to get that um, the the large animals um, with the sheltering operation I can't stress enough that when you're choosing the environment for these animals, in some ways it's really easy. You take them to a fairground that's used to housing large animals, if that's available. But then recognizing how you house these animals, where you house them, and how you provide care for them. It can be dangerous working with any animal. I mean, we all know that because we work with animals um, but with the large animals I think people sometimes don't recognize the additional risk just because of the sheer size of these animals the damage that can be done um, intentional or unintentional on the part of the animal and so um, people who are working with these particular animals need to understand um, they need they should have experience working with them um, with depending on what the species is a lot of times what you have with your horses um, your show animals is you have a much higher owner involvement in that they are used to going to shows they're used to providing care for their animals um, and they may even be bringing feed and that type of stuff and be doing their own feeding cleaning routine um, providing for space for them and figuring out where to put them all of those things um, for example in trailering the you know where the trailers are going to be where they're going to be staying um, on site can you provide accommodations for those owners to be there at all times the other thing with those owners is um, they may um, they may have small animals with them as well and so can you accommodate for the small animals also or are they just hanging out in their trailers with them so so you've, you've looked at what the disaster potentially is you've looked at what type of shelter you're going to do co-located or um, evacuation the, the temporary disaster shelter for the strays your large animal facilities um, which are going to be owned and stray animals also will be coming in in the large animals um, so start thinking about sites where could you accommodate the number of animals that are potentially coming into your facility and so I mean my ultimate goal with this is that you're going to be constantly thinking about oh look at that that would be a great place for us to house animals in the event of a disaster or oh that that would be kind of cool if we could do this or this time of year so one of the big things is fairgrounds are there ag facilities fairgrounds in your community that you could that could accommodate both small and large animal and potentially even do co-located shelter where you know all of the people with animals are going to be able to be living in um, you know a, a coliseum say and then the animals are going to be in other show buildings on the property or in the um, the large animals that are going to be in the fairground pens and barns. Other locations um, that are really good are warehouses. Are there empty warehouses or warehouses that, you know, maybe the majority of the warehouse is in use, but there's sections of it that aren't being used, that are separate, they're isolated buildings um, that you could have access to to house. Um, we I've used um, it was a office complex it was like an industrial complex where there were offices at the front and there was a warehouse attached to the back um, lots of little buildings like that and you'll find that there's still the economy there's still a lot of these kind of properties that are 
being left vacant. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, a lot of these buildings that are vacant, and so you might be able to have access to them. Um, animal care facilities and shelters. The problem with those is capacity, If especially animal shelters. I mean, I, all animal shelters, I think, right now are probably overflowing or at capacity. So in the event of the disaster, do you truly have space to add additional animals to that operation? And if you do have space to run a disaster shelter, what's the capacity of that space? Can you house the number of animals potentially that are coming into your your location? One thing to factor in, and, and you may have good set numbers for your community on what the animal population is, um, but in general, if you expect that every other household is going to have at least one pet, um, and you know, for a lot of households, those numbers vary. They could be um, more than one pet. Your area may be a really high companion animal location. Um, and then certainly for some of the more rural areas where you have the large animal, you know, those numbers are gonna vary quite a bit. So looking at the capacity of the facilities in your area based on what the potential um, number of animals that are going to be coming in. Schools and churches tend to be the co-located. Those are already facilities that the Red Cross has established as a human shelter. And I don't know if we have anybody on here from the Red Cross, um, but getting with your local Red Cross group and finding out if they already have um, sites, because they do, they know where their shelters are going to be and they just then decide whether or not they're going to open locations based on need. But which shelters are going to be your pet friendly shelters? And then are you able to, are they able to accommodate the potential number of animals that are going to be coming into that space? I, I talk all the time about, um, that parking lots really aren't good animal shelter locations and particularly in Colorado looking at the temperatures when disaster season is it's generally very hot it's not going to be a good space for you to be able to house them in um, in the open unless there's a cert unless you have um, proper housing for that. Somebody just typed a question about do I have experience um, with portable animal shelters and yes we actually had one brought into Colorado Springs when we did the fires there a couple years ago and they put up a, a portable shelter it was air conditioned capacity was very small so we had cats in that space and it was able to accommodate them um, but it's not going to be a, uh, for large animals unless you get a number of those kind of portables. Um, but there are there are some really good options out there that people have done. Um, there's a group out of New Jersey, and they converted a um, a semi the trailer from a tractor trailer, and they converted that to their animal shelter. They're actually an island so they know the capacity of that island for the animals and they are able to get the animals loaded up and drive it to an off-site where they're they have an agreement with the local community where they're going to house those but it's targeted specific to just that number of animals um, that they're expecting from their population on that island so there there are options we've used um, tents like your circus tents almost where they've popped up and um, and then you again you're able to provide at least some cover for the animals but it's certainly it's certainly harder depending on the conditions in order to do that um, is there I have another question here is there um, a formula for estimating the number of animals that come into your shelter um, the for planning purposes there there it it varies there's a national formula but if you go to i'm sorry and i 
I'll double check this and, and I can get back to you on this information. I believe it's the AVMA website that you can type in your zip code and it can give you guesstimate of numbers of those animals and what you're expecting. Um, generally the formula I've always gone by is that it, it, at least every other household is going to have one number but I know that varies from location and the numbers have actually increased where I think it, it's actually closer to 65% um, of the population has at least one animal but I'll I'll double check um, Susan I'll I'll double check that and I'll I'll get we'll send that out to the listserv if we can or cover it on the next one but I think it's the AVM website that has that information if anybody else has that answer if you type it in I'll pass it on um, this is this is an example of one shelter and um, this is a site this was a warehouse it was actually a um, massive warehouse it was for ha um, they were making uh, mobile homes at this so it's I mean this doesn't even do justice to how big the facility actually was um, with looking at this type of facility thinking about the amenities that first of all are available one space is obviously amazing here the other piece of it then is the um, uh, water because you have power you have water um, you have restroom facilities potentially kitchen facilities um, with this with the concrete floor you look at that you have a sealed floor it's um, cool in the summer cold in the winter so you have to think about accommodations for those kind of things um, risk of escape is pretty huge here because you have your big bay doors here to the right of the image um, and so looking at ways that you can control this environment safety wise that potentially you're putting up um, the Construction fencing is really great in this kind of environment because you can put that up um, across the doorways where you can still have airflow coming in, um, but you can stop the majority of the animals from escape. Cats obviously are concerned because they hit that. They can get through the holes, um, the smaller ones, um, but hopefully it slows them down that they can't actually escape we did one shelter operation that we actually did the construction fencing all the way to the top of the doors so that nothing could climb up out of that environment. So looking at how you would set up this kind of space and think about what kind of modifications. I mentioned the security here, um, but what modifications would you need to make to this environment to make it suitable and what time of year would those modifications vary so temperature wise how do we control the temperature in this kind of space if it's cold if it's hot those kind of considerations um, here's another shelter setup this was um, another um, warehouse fairgrounds kind of building so you have the concrete here on the sides, the roof, the tin roof on it, um, temperature in here, how are you controlling the temperature with this, how do you control the airflow in this environment, and you can see with the setup where there's not barriers between the cages, but what you have here is space between the cages so that you have an adequate amount of space to reduce the spread of disease by the air, you know, by this distance between those cages. If you aren't using space as a barrier for disease, then you need to use some kind of barrier. Um, and you'll see in about the center of this image, there's, um, there's the cardboard boxes. Those we often use as barriers between the cages. 
so that will help um, what you have though then obviously if you move animals that those boxes are going to have to be replaced by fresh boxes just like the cage is going to be cleaned out and decontaminated between animals the barriers are going to have to be removed and replaced between animals so actually um, the boxes here and then this cage and then as you can see here this is the space between animals lesser space between animals can often be um, that you have family units so they can be closer to one another um, and you're not going to have the problem with them um, contaminating each other but then they can because they're already a family unit but then you can have them close enough that they can see each other which will help reduce stress and concerns from those animals. Here's another shot of that particular facility. You can see the um, doors that are open here at the end. You've got a... a f oh, wait, let me grab my arrow. You have... Oops, sorry, I'm having trouble grabbing my arrow. Sorry, I don't know what's going on with my arrow. It's not working for me. Um, sorry, but you can see the blue tarp there for the um, the barrier, and there's fencing up there to keep animals from escaping from that environment. Um, oh, hey, there it is. So this door is open for airflow, and then the cages, you can see some of these boxes here where there are boxes actually set up as barriers between those animals. This, I'm actually going to show you this too, because this is a really good trick, as when you're talking logistics part of your supplies, get these kind of watering cans that have the thin spouts. They're great for watering the animals, because um, it can just put right in between the wires. Um, and you can water them without having to open up the cages. So, little trick if you didn't know that already. Um, this facility, now this was actually um, Joplin, Missouri a few years ago when the big um, tornado hit there. Um, this was a cat shelter. You can see the um, this white along the sides here is air conditioning venting. This was a metal building. Um, it was so hot. We had cats panting. We had animals that were greatly impacted from the heat. And so in this environment, they were finally able to get air conditioning set up on this to keep this much cooler. Set up with this, there was this fencing on this upper picture. There was fencing as a divider between the animals. Um, these animals at the back were actually animals that had been trapped. Um, our assumption with this population is that the trapped animals were probably um, feral. We actually found out that a lot of them weren't. They were able to get a lot of these guys reunited and there turned out to be really very few of them in the scheme of things that, that were feral compared to the number of animals that were just displaced and frightened, but then kind of mellowed out as time went on. So if anybody has any questions about these setups, please let me know. Um, and then fairgrounds. With the fairgrounds, these work great for your large animals, although you can use the stalls, and I've, I've seen this done where they use the stalls for small animals, so they're putting the wire cages inside the stalls. Um, it adds some additional security, particularly with cats. Again, it's not going to stop them from escaping if they get out, but it certainly can help slow them down um, if they're in this. But primarily, this is an environment where we're going to keep our large animals. <coughs> with these, you can put... Um, groups of animals so like groups of sheep I've even had you know where we've had sheep and their llama that have been housed together in a few of the stalls um, the upper picture here this particular operation um, we didn't actually have 
use of many of the buildings. We had a couple buildings that we were able to use, um, but primarily this space was where we had our dogs and cats in this overhang area. This was phase one of the design. The um, construction fencing was then put on all of these um, panels, and so we were able to um, secure it a little bit better with all of that construction fencing that was on the the panels and um, and actually just really solid handlers that to prevent escapes but there was an in you went in this way with the animals and you could walk them out the back into this yard area and there was a large yard area that we were able to walk the animals all through that and that's something else to consider when you're looking at your facility is not only where you are putting these animals to house them but then where are you walking your dogs and we'll talk in a lot of detail about that in the setup of your shelter um, in in those pieces of the security and how we're arranging our facility but for every every shelter you look at and say oh this would be a really great site for us to have a shelter we also then want to look at um, it is will it accommodate the needs of all of the animals these are a couple other um, operations and the question as far as a temporary this um, this photo here on the upper left is uh, is a is one of those temporary facilities it's actually a tent the nice thing about these is it it um, can be air conditioned, it can be heated, it can accommodate any of the needs of it. Capacity is still a potential concern, but I mean capacity is a potential concern really with any facility. Is it going to be accommodate all the animals that are coming into your operation? Um, but these that kind of works really well, the portables um, that you can set up in a it, that will accommodate more as a co-located shelter than necessarily a temporary shelter. On the upper right, this was a fairground. It's a Kwanzaa hut, which by the way, a Kwanzaa hut for barking dogs is not a great idea. Um, the volume in this facility was deafening, um, but the looking at your fairgrounds as far as all of the different um, spaces that are available in the different buildings that are available and this worked really well you can see the setup what we had is we had um, the cages the bowls were on top the paperwork is on top and I'll talk about all of that when I talk the setup and then there were boxes in between each and every cage this particular um, shelter was actually for a legal action that we were assisting with but you can see the back-to-back -back cages there's boxes between all of the cages and then beside all of the cages and so with that we can maintain disease um, separation and also visual because what we want to try and do is watch for barrier aggressive animals cage crazy um, animals the longer they stay in the shelter the more likely these kind of behaviors will start to develop and so what we want to do is set it up so that we can minimize those kind of challenges and if temperature is not a concern um, then we don't have to worry so much about it getting too hot in this kind of space we actually had the exact opposite problem with this particular space because um, it got very cold and these were um, hoarded uh, actually this was a puppy mill um, and they didn't have very many hairs on their bodies they all had skin issues um, and temperature with a concrete floor so there was a lot of accommodations that needed to be made um, to keep these animals warm enough the bottom picture is actually um, a parking lot and this was a very temporary reaction to a disaster um, the animal shelter itself is actually just to the left there's a building right here if you can see in this lower picture this building right here 
was about a garage and a half, two car garage maybe, um, and that was the community's animal shelter. So when they became the responsible entity for a flood disaster, um, they were scrambling for what they were going to do. And it was um, in Oklahoma, it was in July, and so temperatures were insanely hot, humid, and um, these tarp tents were not sufficient. What it did was it bought them, you know, a couple days to actually find a better site, and we were able to find a fairground location that we were able to move all of the animals to. Um, but one of the biggest things that I stress is if you are going to do some kind of field or parking lot, that the accommodations have to be more like the tent in the upper left or a portable versus um, versus just doing the pop-up kind of tents that are not going to really prevent the heat or the cold from getting to the animals and no security. So assessing um, the facility for accessibility. What we want to look at is what the entrance and exit of the, the building is. So do you have separate entrances and exits that you can move your population through? Big concern is going to be at the very beginning of the disaster. So when you have large numbers of people who are coming because they've just been evacuated and then at the end of the event when they're able to start going home is these um, being able to get everybody out. Parking, parking for your volunteers, parking for your staff, parking for the, the owners or people who are looking for their animals. Is there enough to accommodate all of that? And then what's the accessibility for bringing animals in and what you have if you're looking at like trucks and trailers that are going to be bringing supplies but also um, are is there going to be um, your animal control and your rescue groups bringing them in because with that oftentimes we're going to have you know trucks and large trailers that are going to be bringing in mass numbers of animals that they've picked up from the field and so they're going to be able to need to get them in and and I'll talk shelter setup because accessibility for those folks um, is also going to be a separate location for intake so it's away from the public and then if you're doing a large animal shelter, then having space for those trailers to come in to turn around. I don't know how many of you are familiar with large animals and, and driving trailers, but um, a lot of folks are not able to back their trailers very quickly. Um, and especially in high stress situations. So having a place that there's room for people to turn around or drive through so that they can bring their large animals in, unload them, and then go and park somewhere where they're not having to back and turn, which can take a lot of time. Um, and like I said, in a high stress situation, it can take even longer for those, um, for people to be able to do that. So being able to move people through quickly and safely um, and then housing all of those. So once you've kind of found um, your facilities, looking at getting a memorandum of understanding, an MOU with the facility, what you want to look at is is the when is the property going to be available so sometimes of year it may be available you may get an agreement but then they end up renting the facility and it's no longer going to be available so looking at those pieces of it and what do you need to do to get the facility so fires broke out you just call them up and say hey we need to activate this MOU you know we'll be over in 10 minutes to get the keys <coughs> times that the facility is not available if it's a, a complex that does events is it you know certain calendar that you know you're gonna have to just call and see if they've got something going on in that event um, concerts or shows or um, if it's a if it's an ag is it you know um, 
jumping event or dressage event or horse show, it's barrel race, it's some rodeo, it's something's going on in that time of year that um, you know that ahead of time and it's clear that in the event of disaster it may be available, it may not be, or is it some place that says, you know, if you have a disaster, you call us and we will figure it out, we will make room for you. All of that needs to be figured out. Um, it's helpful if you get a pre-established MOU. It doesn't mean you can't use that facility, and some owners may not want to, you know, have an MOU, but they just say, hey, give me a call and we'll see what we can do. But what the MOU does is it starts a relationship. So you've looked at the facility, you've talked to the owners, they understand what your expectations are, you understand what their expectations are um, with it, what are the, who's going to cover the need, you know, cover the um, utilities and repairs and all of those kind of things. That can be all be laid out in the MOU um, if you can get an owner who's willing to get with you on that. So looking at um, the shelter when you're assessing it for the amenities the things that you need to think about obviously water does it have hot and cold running water is there power to it or would power have to be set up in the event that the that you're going to use the facility what's the lighting are you going to need to provide supplemental lighting um, particularly for the veterinarian um, restrooms is another consideration and with that where are the restrooms located in the shelter um, are there restrooms for the public do you need to bring portables in um, the waste is there a dumpster how big is the dumpster how often is it dumped who's going to foot the bill for the dumpster the security of it security um, protecting the people and the animals so that you have security who's helped kind of guarding it but also consider security as escapes how do you have to set up the walking areas and the entrances and the exits that if an animal escapes can it get onto a road can it get lost in the woods um, and then temperature control this is the hot and cold um, heating can be well both can be a challenge but how do you keep the environment at a moderate enough condition to keep the animals so safe and healthy um, and then that ties back to the power source in what your you what utilities you're using to help keep the temperature moderated um, is it going to pull from the power source so do you need backup generators that kind of thing for um, for it so with the water, hot and cold running water is preferable. The hot water we're going to use for the cleaning. If you are going to be in doing any deconning, washing of the animals, um, can you moderate the temperature of the water so that it's not too cold for the animals? Um, all of it for the cleaning of the equipment. Um, and, it, and again, when I talk the setup of the shelter, I'll talk about cleaning equipment and where we're going to locate that. And then also the drinking water for the animals. Is that water um, that, we, that we can use, that water f to water the animals? And some considerations with that is if you're running hoses, um, to make sure that the hoses are, because um, some hoses are actually listed that, um, the water is potable out of the hose and other hoses have chemicals in them although the, I don't know that the I think it's probably more geared towards people than it is animals but we still want to make sure that there's not anything in chemicals you know lead anything that could be in those hoses that could be a risk to the animals so I recommend considering potable for the hoses for the water with the power I already mentioned looking at the power source as far as that you have um, electric and then generators and always consider backup generators for the for the operation anyway that you may need to run additional power sources um, to supplement what you're already pulling with that what kind of generator are you running and making sure that if it's um, a 
of fuel that where your exhaust fumes how that's set up so that you're not contaminating the shelter with fumes the lighting the big thing for supplemental lighting for your veterinarians so that they can see to be doing the work that they need to be doing in a veterinary station the other thing is that you have the ability to turn the lights down or turn the lights off and one of the things with running the shelter is I I like to do a downtime during the day so whether it's a co-located shelter or it's your evacuation shelter that you have the ability that for at least a couple hours of the day that you're turning those lights down and everybody leaves the shelter and the animals have rest time so they'll get used to the routine and they'll go to sleep the dogs will finally be quiet and everybody will just be able to de-stress because again a less stressed happier more content used to the routine animal is going to be a healthier animal and then at night can you turn the lights off except for security lighting so that they have that nighttime sleep time even if you're running a, you know you have the shelter staffed 24 hours a day I recommend that you do nighttime is sleep time for the animals and your staff is just there to make sure nothing happens overnight additional facilities then having a separate um, restroom facility for your staff and volunteers um, but what we want to make sure is even if it's the same um, restroom you don't have portables that you're bringing in at least where is the restroom located so that it doesn't give people from the public access to the animals or into the like they don't have to walk deep into your shelter to be able to use the facilities <coughs> they may be just looking for animals or you know looking for their lost pet or whatever we want to be able to provide them with that um, but we want to try and control the environment and protect the animals so outside portables always work really nice to to keep that separation and then waste um, you are going to have far more waste than you can possibly imagine during this event and with that um, considering your dumpsters outside but then you're also going to need to have um, your trash cans spread out throughout your shelter um, barrels or trash cans outside in the exercise area um, generally I recommend using paper towels to do the cleaning and so those are those were just throwing away we're not going to have the laundry opportunities to you know wash towels and rags and that kind of stuff so everything pretty much gets thrown away um, so the feces gets picked up immediately in the exercise yards thrown into the trash can towels or rags that are in the pens um, you know bedding for the animals is going to be thrown away and the other and looking at and potentially looking at recycling if that's an option for you um, but the all the water bottles because you're gonna have to supply your your um, volunteers your staff with lots of um, water and probably Gatorade or some kind of a sport drink um, and so all of those kind of things are also going to be disposed of or you know if you can set up a recycling or recycling for all of them with that the dumpsters um, large dumpsters are generally dumped daily multi, every other day something like that we want to make sure that there's easy access to that but we also want to make sure it's not too close to the facility entrance or to you know where it's smelling up the place um, and with that then also considering for the animal carcasses what's your disposal process going to be you aren't going to have animal control or rescue groups that are collecting dead bodies and bringing them back to the shelter um, but obviously there is a possibility that animals will expire when they're at the shelter and then know what the process for disposal of those bodies is going to be and if it is in the dumpster then considerations for how often that dumpster is going to be emptied so you don't have the bodies sitting in there for too long with the carcasses um, make sure that you're talking to whoever the jurisdictional authority is for that or the health department um, and then if it's an owned animal 
well, if you know it's an owned animal, um, notifying the owners of that animal. Um, if it's a stray animal, you know, hopefully you have a photo of the animal before it expired so that if somebody comes looking for that animal, you can at least help them identify it. Um, it's, it's closure for people. So even, I mean, even though they've lost that animal, it's easier for them to know what happened in the unknown. I, I worked a mega shelter in Louisiana. It was um, three years after Katrina and it it was evacuating the people from Louisiana from New Orleans to the lower parishes that had been impacted during Katrina um, and they were still very emotionally scarred by not knowing what happened to their pets um, and they you know they were really concerned about that in the operation that we had going on to make sure that they got their pets back but that closure that you're going to be able to provide people with if if they are looking for a pet you know that 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 pet's expired that you can at least tell them that and they can move on <laughs> excuse me so for security um the big thing i mentioned the animal escapes so we want to make sure that and, and nighttime is a big concern with escapes because they'll be trying to get out of their cages. There's extra security that you can um, provide for it, like zip tying the corners of cages, potentially zip tying doors for the wire cages so that the animals can, even cats and dogs, can flip those cages open and get out. Um, we want to make sure if an animal does get get out, a handler loses them, or an owner opens the door, the animal goes running, um, that it can't get off property. So potentially are you doing a perimeter fencing to keep animals in or at least slow them down? Um, and the other thing is then we want to make sure that we're able to lock the facility down and protect the theft of animals and supplies because um, people will walk with both of those things. Uh, security is also for crowd control. Um, signage el helps with that as well, but with it we want to be able to funnel people where they need to go. So if they have a question, if they're looking for a lost pet, if they're taking care of their pet, that there's somebody at the front that's helping to greet them and helping to direct them where they need to go. And then finally, your overnight security. Can the facility be locked completely down and secured that nobody can get into it? Um, or are you having to staff it? If you're staffing it, then you need to have multiple people there in the overnight so that they, they can cover each other. Nobody should ever be alone. Um, and if it's locked in either way, whether it's locked down or it's being staffed, I would also encourage to do you have um, police presence where they can at least do drive-bys every so often throughout the night and see if there's anything going on. Um, occasionally it's even there have been um, security has been hired so you have um, night security that just comes on and they're armed and and they're watching the operation. For temperature control your air conditioning um, that the Joplin they were able to go through emergency management and FEMA helped um, supply them with that air conditioning unit um, buying that or getting access to that kind of thing or renting it can be very expensive and certainly not resources that most of us are going to have in a disaster situation uh, so being able to tap into that heat I've actually found has been a lot harder I showed you the picture of the Kwanzaa hut um, that that facility actually couldn't run plugged in heat it pulled too much and it would kill the light source so when you're checking a facility to see you know what's the ability to house it that's something to consider is how much energy pull can you have before it you're tripping the the circuits on it um, so being able to provide heat for it setup of the shelter 
also can help with the temperature control where if you have it's really hot that you have the animals that are where there's better airflow that have thicker coats um, in the in the cold weather that you're putting your smaller your uh, more susceptible animals or your thinner coat animals more to the interior of your setup to keep the temperature the heat and I mean there are other things that we can do certainly to accommodate it but um, but then there's the fans and regardless of whether it's hot or cold we're often going to have fans that are going to be blowing not as much for the temperature control as for airflow and airflow is something that's really critical in considering how you're setting up your operation because what we want to do is we want to control how air is moving through the facility that it's going through your healthy animals out past the sick animals and then out of the building. Ideally you would have your sick animals in a completely different building or completely different location but reality is it's a disaster and you may not have that option and so the fans are going to be set up specifically for the airflow uh, and it's going to be important that you brief everybody who's working at the shelter so they understand how the fans are set up that 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 that's what it's about it's about airflow and if there's an animal that is um, too hot or too cold then that will need to go to command so they can adjust it but not volunteers just relocating the fans because then that messes with how your your air is flowing so um, for modifications you know with your concrete your floors and that we want to um, we want to be able to one it's really great when it's it's hot and people are going to want to put towels blankets you know bedding into cages because the floors are hard but what the animals are going to prefer is that they have the cold temperature that they're getting from the draw of the concrete floor and the cage floor to keep them cooler modifications to a concrete floor is certainly going to be looking at um, it being very slippery when it gets wet um, so we're going to need to you know take precautions to protect the public and the volunteers with that but it's really pretty easy to clean and sanitize as long as it's a sealed floor it makes cleanup at the end of the event much easier as well because we can properly clean and sanitize the the property before we leave it <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if um, for cold floors, putting cardboard underneath the crates will help keep it um, block some of that cold from coming up in. Um, putting blankets inside the crates, covering the crates with blankets, um, or putting in newspapers in the crates, all of that can help moderate those cold temperatures um, if, if it's a cold event and you're needing to warm the animals up with your dirt floors and this is a a lot with the um, fairgrounds the building you can see the background slide that building was actually a mega shelter it was the mega shelter I talked about for Louisiana for Shreveport um, this was a fairground facility the Coliseum right next door was where the people were housed and then the animals were in this it was a dirt floor with it putting the putting shavings down in the aisleways, if an animal urinates or defecates, we could then pick up the shavings. It wasn't getting into the dirt. Um, it kept it the dust down. It kept the mud down, um, and it it gave us, you know, something that we could pick up. But obviously, um, extreme things as far as sanitizing that, it can be challenging, especially if you have some kind of outbreak. Tarps also work well putting tarps down particularly cats or you have your pug-nosed animals that have respiratory any kind of respiratory putting tarps down over top of the dirt floor and then putting the cages on top of that it's still harder to keep those clean but it can work in modifying the environment and everything you want to think about is it's a disaster so how do we modify this environment to make it work if you're in a school or a church or some kind of an office, these um, putting down tarps 
covering carpeted floors, wood floors, um, putting down tarps on those, and you can actually um, overlap and duct tape those, and you can tape them up the walls as well to help protect the walls in those kind of spaces. We always want to make sure we leave the environment um, as good as or better than we found it. Uh, and so the, the pet-friendly shelters are much harder um, to do that in because they're really not meant to be animal shelters. So modifying that environment um, is going to be really important to protect the environment as well as the animals. Um, the wood floors, it's the same thing, being very careful that we're covering those up. We're not scratching those floors up. Um, and so tarps work really well with that. And maybe even laying, instead of just laying down the plastic tarps, that you're laying down um, like a painter's cloth or something like that. And then the tarp on top of it to protect that kind of wood floor from any kind of scratching. And then with the layout of the shelter, um, how we're setting it up, and this is going to be primarily the next section, but when you're assessing the facility for whether or not it would work, you want to think about what the layout would be. So the areas of consideration in it are, first of all, your animal housing. What animals you're taking in and where they're going to be, where the dogs are going to be housed, where your cats are going to be housed, where your specialty animals are going to be housed, and then the ability to run the operation. So hopefully you have a veterinarian that is there at all times that's able to do maintain the medical care of those animals throughout or do exams when things come up. So a veterinary station for them. Um, cleaning and sanitation is going to be an ongoing thing inside the shelter, but then also do you have a cleaning sanitizing station that's outside or in a space within the shelter where you're not going to get contaminants throughout the rest of the shelter. People can't walk their animals through it, that kind of thing. Where's the intake going to be? Does the facility have space for you to have an intake for your different species that are coming in, potentially, depending on your numbers, um, or an intake for animal control, search and rescue, versus your owned animals? You're going to need to have space in the facility where you can have all of your supplies coming in, like your warehouse, um, and you will get lots of supplies. People are going to be coming from miles around to make donations, and so you need to plan for lots of donations to come in on top of potential donations that are you or potential supplies that you already have stockpiled or that you are bringing in. There should be a place for your volunteers so that you have a place for them to sit and to relax, to eat, um, a place for them to get something to drink and just kind of get away from the commotion of it. So is there a location inside the facility or is there another location that you can set up for those folks to go? And, um, and then finally with this, um, so we've talked about a lot of stuff and we'll we'll break it down more as we go through the additional sections of this but looking at every facility you look at the big thing to first say okay what potentially is facing us if it's a fire that you're looking at fire moves so where are you setting up your location potentially could the um, if the fire moves in your direction, do you need to um, to relocate that facility to another shelter so that you have a backup for that? The looking at at the temperature, the time of year that the disaster hits, what facility is going to work for this particular disaster, this particular time of year? like an open fairground. It's going to be great in the summer as long as there's not fair, but in the winter time it's not going to accommodate animals outside. And then looking at what kind of shelters you're going to do. Every operation, every facility may be better at accommodating particular kind of, so a co-located shelter might be great with a school 
but a fairground is going to be better for your your evacuation shelter, your disaster animals that you're having both stray come in, where a co-located shelter is not going to be able to accommodate those. So assessing each facility for these kind of things. The species, what do you have coming into the facility? And with this, with this building, with this fairground, with this tent, accommodate all of those kind of species that were coming in. And what modifications can you do to whatever operation, whatever facility you happen to decide on, what kind of modifications you need to do. So hopefully going through all of this, those are the things that kind of jumped out at you to start looking at. And every single building, every single space, you want to look at all of these four items plus potentially more that you're going to think about. Would that facility work for this particular thing? So, and big thing I can't stress enough, keep in mind this is a disaster. So best case scenario, you have your, your facility, you already know going into it where the facility is going to be at. You know how you're going to set it up because you've already got your MOU, you have places that you can um, already have planned out how you're going to lay out the facility, which we'll talk about in the next next week. Um, but you have all this stuff already figured out, so it makes it flow better. But the first three days of a disaster operation is chaos. The animals don't have the routine. The people don't have the routine. There's in and out, and there's getting things set up. There's getting things figured out, um, and you just need to be adaptable. You need to be flexible with everything. And if it's not working the way it is set up, then be prepared to make those changes so that you can make it into a better flowing situation. Um, there was a question here. Um, is it possible to set up a morgue for animals um, for owners to identify? I mean, yeah, it is. It's, it's certainly... Um, we... I, I used um, a reefer truck, the refrigerated trucks for, it was a forensic case I was working on. Um, so we had dug the bodies up, we did our exams on them, and then we put them in the reefer trucks to, you know, to maintain the temperature for them. I, you know, something like that may be an option to do. Legitimately, you're not going to have a lot of dead animals. I mean, you shouldn't have a lot of dead animals at the facility. Once we get them there, um, we tend there tend not to be a lot of loss. And what you don't have the capability generally in a disaster is to be picking up bodies from the field and then bringing them in. It's it, it there's so many other things going on and cleanup is actually a different branch of of disaster response and so that cleanup piece of it would not fall into the the ESF 11 that you folks will fall under in um, the the designation for FEMA or the designation for emergency management in the plan and so those bodies aren't going to be coming in but if you do have some animals that are expiring if you can if you can hold them for the owners, it's certainly, you, it's your shelter, you can do, you know, what you want. So, there is no one perfect um, setup, but there are certainly ways that you can set it up in certain facilities that are going to work better than others. Um, start planning the things we talked about here in what you need to consider for your facility and then start looking for sites that you think might work once you find a site then put together you know you have your plan here put together what a layout would look like and practice it bring in animals or do setups and do routines and just do mock scenarios that you can do that the more you train the more you practice the more familiar you are with the facility the smoother it's going to run once you get into a, a real disaster so um, that's the wrap up for this if you have questions there's Deborah Schnockenberg's information with um, pet aid 
and my information is below. You can certainly email me if you have any questions. Um, and if there's any last minute questions here before we go, please feel free to type one up. Otherwise, I think that's a wrap. So, oh, wait, I have a couple questions coming through. Oh, nope, I have a couple thank yous. You're welcome. Thank you so much for attending.